morning. If you would, grab a Bible. Let's turn together to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4. We'll be reading from there, and that will be where we begin our time of study this morning. Philippians chapter 4. So good to see you here. Uh, We have visitors with us, and we always want you to know that we're excited that you're here, and we want you to feel welcome among us, but we appreciate you taking the time and making the effort to be here at a place uh, where you might not know anyone and uh, where it may be uh, new faces to you. But we want to get to know you, and we want to help you in any way we can to know more about Jesus and what we do here as we try to serve him. We're going to begin in Philippians 4 and verse 10. So I'd like to read these uh, as an introduction this morning. Philippians 4 and verse 10, it says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So Paul is thanking the Philippians for giving him some support after a long time where they had not. And he says in verse 11, I'm not asking because I'm in need. I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. He also says in verse 12, I know how to be brought low. Or that word your translation might have to be abased or to be humbled. What he means is, I know how to be poor and I know how to be rich. That there is a way to be brought low and a way to be enriched. A right way and a wrong way. We're continuing our series of studies that we've been doing throughout this month called What Do I Do When? And the focus of our studies is practical, biblical advice for life. And we're talking about specific situations that we deal with that we need to know God's view about. In many ways, I intend for this series to be sort of like the conversation we would have if you were to come sit down in my office or if you were to sit down with one of our elders and you were to say, what should I do? I'm facing this problem. I'm feeling this way. How should I respond? And to then go to the Bible to ask God for what is his perspective about that. So we've talked about what would I do if life falls apart, or what should I do when I feel discouraged by the church, or this morning, what should I do when I have money troubles, when I'm not sure that I can make ends meet? Money troubles have a lot of different guises. Knowing the makeup of our group here, We have a lot of our college kids who are starting out on their own, and they just don't have money. They don't have much of anything, and so they're trying to figure out, am I going to find somebody to marry? There's some anxiety about the job that I'm going to get, the career I'm going to have, where I'm going to live, how I'm going to make ends meet with the lean years that may be the beginning of their story. But it's not just young people. Sometimes money troubles have to do with a career that never really takes off, or a job that is going well, but then we lose it, or that we were never able to get the education or skills that we needed to find a career that would really sustain us for our entire lives. And so money in those situations just stays at the forefront of our minds. We focus on it all the time. If you have ever been in a desperate or dire financial situation, you know it's hard to think about anything else. You know that it begins to overwhelm you. You might even, this morning, be in a situation where you think that you'd like to go have fun and you'd like to go hang out with your friends or maybe you'd like to go out on a date, but in the back of your mind, you're always thinking, I don't know if I can even do that. How much does it cost? And so money becomes the thing through which, the lens through which you see all the things in your life. And when that happens, there is another consequence. That is, we also look around at other people who have different amounts of money than we do, and it's very easy to resent others. I don't think we seem to notice as much people who don't have as much as we do. We don't look around for them. We look around to those who have more, or we look at them with resentment because if I had what they had, I wouldn't do what they're doing with it. And so it becomes a a source of discontent and even can be a separation between friends or brothers and sisters in Christ. I have to say, as I begin this morning, that I've had my share of money troubles. And it's some long stories that I'm not going to share with you this morning. Uh, If you want to come talk to me about it, I guess I'll probably tell you a little bit about it. But I have to also confess, as as I prepared these thoughts and looked through the scriptures, 
that I, I believe I come at this topic in sort of a middle-class way. I was raised in a middle-class home, and I live in a middle-class home. And I don't want anything I'm going to say this morning to be taken as if you have to live a middle-class life to please the Lord. That you have to do what I would do or make the money decisions I would make. I don't believe that, and I'm not trying to say that. However, it seems to me that when we look at the Bible and what the Bible has to say about situations like these, we will find some practical wisdom that will help us. I'm just going to apologize, I guess, from the beginning or warn you from the beginning that I am aware that that's the way I come across because that's the way I live and the way I was raised. But I don't want anyone to think that we're suggesting or I'm suggesting that money troubles mean that you can't serve the Lord. And so I want us to, as we go through that, to try to talk through how we would address someone who came with this issue, and then what are some biblical guidelines for how we kind of move forward with this problem. So the first thing I would say, uh, and the first thing I think the Bible would say, is try to find profitable work. That would be the first thing if you have money trouble. The first Bible answer is that the biblical priority is that we work to provide for ourselves and for others. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We looked at a few of these in our uh, daily readings that we covered in the last couple of months here. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, the Thessalonians evidently had an issue where they were not working as they should have. There's a lot of uh, guesses as to why that was, but Paul gives instruction about how work is important to Christian living and to how we make money and, and support ourselves. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 11, it says, to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs, or yours might say, mind your own business, and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. So this is God's will for our lives. It says specifically in verse 11 that we work with our hands, that we become sort of self-sufficient. And I don't mean self-sufficient as an independent from God. I mean self-sufficient as in other people are not sustaining us. He says in verse 12, so that you may walk properly before outsiders. That is, you show the world the appropriate way Christians live. And he also says in verse 12, and be dependent on no one. It's not God's will that other people have to continually take care of us. He wants us to stand on our own feet, and that will involve work. He says, work with your own hands. That does not mean that there are not situations where we might need help. It is instead a call to, I should not continually be dependent on others. So as we establish what's generally expected, we have to say, this is where that begins, trying to find profitable work. Turn the page over to 2 Thessalonians 3. 2 Thessalonians 3, same group, the Thessalonians, same problem. Stronger words here. 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6, it says, Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some walk among you and some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busybodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. That last phrase actually is the Greek to eat their own bread. So the problem here is not that some people were needy but that some people were idle and not willing to work. In verse 10, it says, if anyone is not willing to work, that word willing is important because we do acknowledge that there are maybe times where I'm willing to work, trying to work, but I'm not able for some reason, whether that's physical incapacity, whether that's because I can't find a job, whatever that may be, but the willingness is the important part there. If anyone is unwilling to work, he says, don't let him eat. And in, in specifics here, in Thessalonica, there were people who refused to work. They were unwilling to work, and then they would come to the church, to their brothers and sisters, and ask for help. 
And so when he says in verse 10, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat, he's saying don't feed people who are unwilling to work. Don't supply that. Don't encourage that because that's not the way Christians live. He says in verse 12, we command and encourage you in the Lord Jesus to do their work quietly and to earn their own living, to eat their own bread. So this is the biblical perspective, that we're intended by God to do work to support ourselves and to support those who are in our care. Ephesians 4.28, let the thief steal no longer, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let him labor where he used to steal. Now let him work so that he can have something that he has get made with his own hands that he can give to others who were in need. We also have, and by the way, from time to time in this lesson, we're going to refer to Ecclesiastes, which has a very interesting perspective on all of this. But this is a, a Ecclesiastes, whoop, that was it. Ecclesiastes 2, 24 to 25. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? So I want you to notice, you know, Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes has a pretty grim outlook. But one of the few things he says is good is work and enjoying the fruit of your work. He says that's a good thing. It's a gift of God. Drink and eat and find enjoyment in your work. So if you have money troubles, the first thing that I'm going to ask you is, where and how are you working to support yourself and others? Now, work does not guarantee that all our money problems will be solved, but we have to begin here because the Bible begins here. This is how we're expected to make money. So this is usually the primary way that God blesses us monetarily. And I want you to think about the difference in perspective this may mean. This may mean that if I have money troubles, I'm probably not going to come out of my money troubles in one big score. I'm going to find all this money. Someone's going to give me a giant gift. I'm going to win the lottery. Something big is going to happen, and it's all going to be reversed. No, the biblical pattern is I'm going to work, and I'm going to maybe slowly begin to be able to provide for myself and others. So that necessitates a perspective shift where we begin to say, okay, I need to be comfortable with the idea that my money problems are not all going to be solved at once, but instead I'm going to work and God will supply. It may be that there are some other things to consider here, not just work. I understand, you know, in, in our time, we could talk about credit consolidation. If you have a lot of debt, we could talk about, do I need to change careers? I said profitable work for that reason. We could talk about, do I need something to help with disability? Something like that. There's a whole lot of conversations to have about that. But none of those solutions should ever be viewed as a replacement for work. The biblical perspective is work. Second. Distinguish needs from wants. I want you to go with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6. <clears throat> it is a bit shocking to live in our world and then go read the biblical perspective on wealth and possessions because they are radically different. The way you and I are brought up, the air that we breathe as Americans is so different from what the New Testament authors, in fact, the Bible generally has as a perspective on wealth. I want you to hear Jesus in Matthew 6, 25, and I want you to think as you read this passage with me, what is on the minds of his audience? What are they worried about? Matthew 6, 25, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So I 
asked you to think about as we read, what is on the minds of Jesus' audience? He says, don't be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or what you will wear. He is not saying, don't worry about which restaurant you're going to go to or which one of your many suits of clothes you'll put on today. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, don't worry if you'll eat or if you'll have clothes to put on. These are people who are living hand to mouth, day to day. They go to work and they get paid that day for that day's work. And with that day's wage, they get that day's food. Give us this day our daily bread. This is how they live. And Jesus tells them, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink. I'm not sure any of us have lived that existence. And yet here, Jesus is saying, don't worry. God will take care of you. And the promise he gives in verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. If you seek God first, you will have what you need. You will have all these things. Please note that Matthew 6, 33 is a beautiful and important promise, but it is not a promise that we will have every gadget we want and every desire of our hearts if we just seek God first. That's not what he says. He says the things you need, your food, your clothes, will be added to you. God will take care of you. So I want to show you again, this is the biblical perspective. There are things you need, and that's what God says, I will help you take care of. And then there are things that you want. And so if you're going to come to me and we're going to talk about money troubles, I would say we need to distinguish needs from wants. Again, the biblical perspective is radically different. Look at 1 Timothy 6 and verse 6. He says, but godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. I hope you noticed that Solomon says the same thing in Ecclesiastes 5 that Mike read for us this morning. We brought nothing into the world. We can take nothing out of the world. No matter how many zeros are in our bank account, no matter how much we accumulate, we don't take anything with us. But if we have food, and clothing, with these we will be content. It's a pretty low bar. Food and clothing. The needs, the necessities of life. Not everything you might want. And at that standard, how much do we actually need? So, if we can distinguish needs from wants, it might explain how that would be relevant to money troubles. First, it might mean that we don't really have money troubles at all. It might mean that what we have is just some things that we want that we can't afford. And so it might be that we need to sift a little bit and think through this. The fact that we don't get to buy everything in the world that we set our hearts on doesn't mean we have an issue. That's just life. And that will always be true no matter how much money we make, how much money we have. Sometimes this means that we can put ourselves into debt for things that are not necessities. And I want to say a word about this. It has become an American pastime to just take on debt for just about any reason. Last month, total American credit card debt passed $1 trillion, which means, according to the numbers that I looked at, the average American family has about $20,000 just in credit card debt alone. We take out loans for our extras. That's what we do. And so the average American household has mortgage debt and auto debt and credit card debt. And we just have to ask the question, is this all things that I need? And I want to remind you, the Bible is not high on debt. This is Romans chapter 13. It says, pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Owe no one anything except to love each other for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. You notice he's kind of transitioned from, you know, pay your taxes to owe no one anything. There are things that are due to others, pay what's due, but he says, don't get into a relationship where you can't pay. The Proverbs warn against debt. They say things like, the borrower is the slave of the lender. It is an unwise practice. Now, please don't misunderstand me as we talk about debt. 
I don't believe these passages are teaching, Romans 13, the Proverbs, any of them, that our modern system of debt financing is wrong, it's wrong to have debt or anything like that. I am arguing, and what I'm trying to point out is that overextending ourselves into debt for things we don't really need seems foolish and gets us into trouble. And when we have money troubles, we have to acknowledge that. And one of the keys may be just distinguishing, do I need this or do I just want it? So I retreat to the biblical state. With food and clothing, we'll be content. And we need to think in this way. In fact, I'll just say it. The numbers that I looked at show me that a large percentage of those listening to me right now have a significant amount of credit card debt and student loan debt. And I would say that being able to distinguish between need and want may help you come out of that debt. Because you might be able to say, you know, for now, I may want that, but I don't need it, and so I'm going to say no. And we're going to scrimp and save and cut back for a little while to work our way out of this. Third, find ways to give. Remember that the passage that we've already read about giving, I'm sorry, about working, also talks about giving. It was Ephesians 4.28, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Here's the Bible again saying, no, you don't make money so you can have it to spend on all your stuff. You make money so you can take care of yourself and then with what's left over, you can help others. You can share with anyone who is in need. Let's go to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. Talk a little bit about finding ways to give. Now, if you're here this morning and you're having money troubles, you may already be frustrated with me from things I've already said. And then I put find ways to give on the board and you get frustrated even more because it feels like, well, I don't have anything to give. And I just want to show you that there is a different perspective on giving that the Bible has than what we typically have. Mark 12, 41, Mark 12, 41, it says, and he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who were contributing to the offering box, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Here's a woman who is a poor widow. I don't think it's a coincidence that this story comes right after Jesus criticizing scribes who devour widows' houses, take advantage of poor widows, and now they don't have anything. They're giving their last pennies in the temple. She has nothing left, and yet Jesus honors her in her tiny little contribution. Two small copper coins next to nothing, She's not getting her name on any buildings. Nobody's paying any attention to her sacrifice, but Jesus sees her. And he says in verse 43, she has put in more, more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. We don't have to be wealthy to learn to give. In fact, it seems to me essential that we don't forget how to give and the importance of giving just because we don't have a lot left over to give. Here the widow shows us this is what matters to God. Go with me over to 2 Corinthians 8. 2 Corinthians 8. Second Corinthians 8, beginning in verse 1. So the context here is that Paul had rounded up a contribution from some of the Gentile churches to take to the needy saints in Jerusalem. And he wants to brag about the Macedonian churches to the Corinthians so that the Corinthians are inspired to do more. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 1, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God, 
to us. So here are people. He says they had extreme poverty in verse 2, and yet it became a wealth of generosity. I wonder if Paul is not talking about them the way Jesus talked about that widow. As in, you know, this didn't do a lot for the bottom line, but I know where it came from, and I know how hard it was, and I know what it meant to them, and I saw them beg me, please just take it, just take it, just take it. And he says, this is what I want you to see. They were so excited to give that it didn't matter that they didn't have a lot. In verse 12, he says, 2 Corinthians 8, 12, for if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. God looks at us and says, what do they have? And then what do they give? He does not judge us based on what other people have whether we can give as much as the billionaires can give. But what do we do with what we have? And so I want to encourage you, find ways to give. Now, I know this is hard, because when we're in money troubles, all we see is the trouble. In fact, I have been in situations where I viewed the need to give almost as a threat, because I was working hard to pull us out of our hole. And so when there were needs, you begin to see everything as, oh, no, they're coming for my money. I know that it's hard in times like that to be open to giving. But sometimes there are people who are in need. Find ways to give to them. The Bible warns us repeatedly, Jesus does especially, about the nature of money. About how money can have a corrosive effect on our hearts. About how it can bring us to love it, to serve it to bypass the kingdom for it, to ignore those in need around us because of it. Let me just remind you that the antidote to greed is generosity. The way we make sure we're not clenching onto our money is to let it go. Find ways to give. These stories show us it doesn't matter if the amount is small. God is watching what is happening in our hearts, and God is evaluating how our hearts are. Now, you might say, okay, well, I really literally don't have anything to give in terms of money. Can we still give something? Can we still give our time and attention and presence, our inclusion, our love? Can we give someone something? Can we focus on other people and not ourselves? Again, I will say I have been in situations where I was struggling financially, and I was so focused on myself that I ignored the needs around me. Find ways to give. Find people to focus on. And the last thing I want us to talk about is consider your ways. I want you to go with me to the book of Haggai, chapter 1. <clears throat> Haggai, chapter 1. I'll give you a minute to find it. This is the time where those who are using electronic Bibles have an advantage over those of us who are trying to figure out where Haggai fits in the prophets. I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to say that when we have money troubles, it is a wonderful time to take stock of our lives and consider our ways. Now, a lot of what I'm going to say applies to us no matter whether we have money troubles or not. But I want to especially say these are times where we might be having a wake-up call. That's what happens in Haggai's day. It says Haggai chapter 1 and verse 3. It says, then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Does that describe your household any? Tell you what, the bag with holes, sometimes it feels like that, doesn't it? You work and you work and you work, and it never seems to add up. When you bring it home, it scatters. Now in Haggai, the message is that they focus so much on their 
households, their lifestyles, their paneled houses, that they've neglected the temple. They've neglected God's work. And so that was a very visible thing. You could see your nice house and God's crummy house. Consider your ways. It's a call to consider the deeper spiritual implications of our financial state. That's what it is. So I want to be clear. I am not saying that all poor people are being judged by God. I am not saying that every financial issue is based on this. I'm saying, isn't there a time to think about how we're living? So I want to ask you a few questions. Consider your ways. What am I pursuing? When we have financial problems, that can be, as I've mentioned, overwhelming and consuming. It starts where we're just trying to make ends meet, and then it becomes, well, I just want to make a little more and a little more and move up a little, and then it becomes, well, I need to plan for my retirement and what's going to happen after that. And before long, we live most of our lives just focused on the money. What am I pursuing? Remember, Jesus said to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seek first the kingdom, and all these things will be added to you. Is God and his work and his kingdom and his righteousness really the focus of my life? You see, in Haggai's day, money troubles got the people's attention, which, by the way, is also what happened in Elijah's day, where there was a drought that got the people's attention, which, by the way, is also what happened in Amos's day, where there was famine that also got the people's attention. Have you noticed that God seems to work in this way where sometimes we need something to get our attention and say, hey, everybody, let's wake up. Consider your ways. Paul writes, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierce themselves with many pangs. If you were to take the word money out of that text and put anything else in its place, this would be a shocking text. Because it says senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction, all kinds of evils, wandering from the faith, piercing themselves with all kinds of pangs. It's treacherous. Now my question is, if I loved money, would I even be able to acknowledge it? I have never met a person who says, yep, I love money. I love it. I think it's the best. None of us thinks they do. So how could that be? How would we know? Consider your ways. Ecclesiastes 4, again, I saw vanity under the sun. One person who has no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil. His eyes are never satisfied with riches, so that he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. He says there are people who are working. Who are they working for? What am I working for? And they never ask. They never ask a question like, do I work so hard to provide for my kids and my wife that I never get to see my kids and my wife? They never ask a question like, am I storing up money to enjoy by isolating myself from the people I'm hoping to enjoy it with? They never ask the question, what's really happening? And Solomon says, this is vanity. This is a waste. It is a great evil. What am I pursuing? This may be a great time to truly, in a soul-searching way, ask that question. Consider your ways. Ask yourself, am I causing this problem? If you have money problems, I am not saying that just because you have money problems, you've caused it. But I am saying, isn't there a place to ask? Is this my fault? I'm thinking of statements like this. Be not among drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat, for the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and slumber will clothe them with rags. The drunkard and the glutton, the wasteful ones. 
This is Proverbs 6, 9 to 11. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. Proverbs 28, 19. Whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits will have plenty of poverty. I am not saying everyone who is poor has done that and followed that path, but I am saying if we are struggling, maybe we need to ask, am I the one who is wasteful? Am I the one who is lazy? Am I the one who is involved in worthless pursuits? And that's gotten me where I am. Is there not a place to consider our way? Is there not a place to say my money troubles may be because of the person in the mirror? Am I causing this problem? And the last question I want to ask is, can I be content? Remember, we started with Paul. Paul said, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. I know how to be poor, and I know how to be rich. There's a right way and a wrong way to do it. He says, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. The Hebrew writer says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be content with what you have. Be content with what you have. Don't be content with what you will have. Don't be content with what someone else has. Be content with what you have. This says contentment is a choice we always make. It is never about how much we have. And if we are not content with little, we will not be content with much. I know some of you are thinking, that may not be true. I'd sure like to have more so that I could figure it out. But it is an ironclad rule. He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver. It doesn't work. Be content with what you have. Can I be content? There will always be circumstances that we cannot control. Can I be content in difficult and frustrating times? There are a couple of Proverbs that I just love. Don't worry, we're near the end here. There are a couple of Proverbs that I just love. Proverbs 17.1, better is a dry morsel with quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. Dry morsel kind of sounds gross, right? But just a little, oh, but it's quiet. If you've lived with strife, you know, oh yeah. Better to be poor and happy than rich and miserable. Better is a dinner of herbs. Yes, that's salad. You have to eat salad. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fattened ox and hatred with it. Rather be poor and in love than rich and hated. Can I be content? Maybe what that means is that I need to focus my attention and my energy on what I can change, what I can control, my attitude, love, peace. Maybe it's that I need to celebrate what I do have that I may not have a lot, but I have gifts from God. I have people who love me. I have opportunities. I have health. I have good things in my life. We've sung today, count your blessings. Name them one by one, and you'll see what the Lord has done. Maybe I need to focus on the good in my life. But can I be content? It may be that in your money troubles, this is a great time to ask. Can I really be happy right where I am if nothing else changed? Not waiting for the next thing, not the next promotion, not the next big job, not that person saying yes to me. Can I be content? Consider your way. I don't intend any of this to be critical. I know it may come off as a little critical. I do believe this is hard. I have lived it, as I mentioned, and I don't want to put an extra burden on anyone who is struggling in this way. And also, each situation is so unique that it's really challenging to speak broadly about it. But I want to say that the good news of the gospel is that how much money we have never defines us. It's not who you are, and it will never be who you are. No matter how much or how little you have, it does not matter to God. It doesn't make you more or less acceptable to God. 
In fact, Paul warns us, don't trust in uncertain riches, but be rich in good works and lay up a foundation for the life to come. So don't let your financial state sabotage your faith and don't let it keep you from trusting God. Seek first the kingdom and you'll have what you need. Thank you so much for your good attention this morning. This is the time of our service where we offer the invitation. And so in just a moment, we will sing a song and we'll all stand. And the goal of this moment is so that if there is someone in our building today who is ready to respond to the invitation of the Lord to come out of their sins and to come to him, leaving behind that life that you've lived and choosing to follow him, to put your faith in him, to be buried with him in baptism, to be raised to walk as a new person, ready to live a new life. We'd love to help you do that this morning. So you can come to the front and make that known. Or if you have a struggle, if you have a sin, if you have an issue that you think it would help for us to know about, we would pray with you about that. We would work on how we could help you with that. And so now would be a great time to let that be known. If you have any need, please come to the